All right, we're going to go ahead and get going. Any of you that are wanting to get your sheet stamped and out of here, now's the time. Okay. All right, so this morning we've got our next presentation is pivoting into a sustainable class A biosolids management program. And for our presentation this morning, we have Kristen Preston. She is the City of Albany's Public Works Operations Manager, responsible for the daily operation and maintenance of the city's water, wastewater, stormwater, and transportation utilities. She has 22 years of experience in civil and environmental engineering and public works experience working in both private and public sectors. We also have Charles Wright. He has been working on water, wastewater, water distribution and collection facilities, infrastructure planning, design and construction management for more than 25 years. He has been with Kennedy Jenks since 2005 in their Eugene office. And I will turn it over to you both. Okay, so um, thank you for all being here at the last session, the last day we can do this. Um, so I'm gonna give some background on the city of Albany and the improvements that we needed at our facility and talk about our dewatering and solids treatment selection process just a little bit, which we um, moved are moving to a class A compost system. So I'm gonna talk about from the owner's perspective and then I'm gonna turn it over to Charles who will talk from the um, consulting uh, team perspective and go through the design and construction, go through lessons learned, uh, and then I'll come back and talk about next steps for the city of Albany. So just a little bit of background, Albany, Oregon, uh, population just over 56,000, so not, not huge, but not tiny. Uh, we're in the heart of the Willamette Valley um, between uh, Salem and Eugene along the I-5 corridor. Uh, we are surrounded by uh, agriculture. So Lynn County, one of the counties we're in, is known as the grass seed capital of the world, um, self-proclaimed, I think. Um, and we also have lots of industry um, uh, related to the specialty metals uh, industry. Um, Albany is known, also known for our uh, large um, quantities of uh, historic homes and businesses. We also have a historic carousel. Uh, I think our, our people um, got some inspiration here from the carousel in Spokane. So come, come visit our carousel. Uh, we also have a, a historic sewer system. It's very old. Um, so here's just an, an overview of our, our sewer system throughout the city. Uh, our collection system is a class four system and so is our, our treatment plant. We have over 200 miles of gravity mainline, 13 lift stations throughout the city, about seven miles of force mains. And I think now we have 17 significant industrial users that are managed through our pretreatment program, which I think is a lot for a city our size. Um, we have, um, I don't have a pointer, but you can, by the river, you can see where the WRF is, a riverfront property there. Um, and we also have a treatment uh, constructed wetland known as Talking Water Gardens, and it was built for heat load mitigation. So the treated effluent from the WRF goes through the wetland before it goes to the Willamette River, which you can see running through the city there. Um, we jointly own those facilities with the city of Millersburg to the north. It's a, a small town. Um, they own a portion of the capacity. We maintain their collection system uh, for them, and we have an agreement with, with them. Just briefly, uh, history of the plant. It was originally constructed in 1952 uh, and then upgraded in 69 with activated sludge, uh, secondary treatment, and anaerobic digestion uh, was constructed at that time. There was probably lots of other upgrades, but of note, in 2001, we constructed uh, belt filter press uh, dewatering systems, a new biosolid storage facility, and at that time we had a Class B land application program where we applied on all those grass seed fields around us. Then in 2009, we completely basically built a whole new plant. Um, we uh, reused some of the old plant elements, but um, we installed new headworks and we went for our um, aeration basins, what's called as vertical loop reactors. Uh, VLRs, they're, they're not uh, all that common. Um, 
if you're in the last one, they had oxidation ditches and it's like that, but they're sort of turned on their side. Uh, we don't have primary clarifiers. Um, and at the, when the plant was built, it was constructed around the cannibal uh, solution, uh, solids reduction system. Uh, and that's a side stream solids reduction process. And along with that, we went to uh, aerobic digestion and slash interchange reactors. And that's a, a component of the uh, cannibal system. We built all new secondary clarifiers, new disinfection and new operations building and went um, fully automated. The last plant was, I don't think had much in the way of automation. So that's a plant in a nutshell. Um, the uh, design capacity, the average dry weather flow capacity is 12.3 MGD. Uh, instantaneous peak wet weather flows uh, capacity is 68 MGD. We're not a combined facility. Um, we used to be years ago. Um, and we do have some I, &I issues. We've got leaky pipes uh, as many of uh, us do. Uh, we've got a pretty robust CMOM program. So we're trying to get after that, that I, &I but we still have wet weather issues. We, our permit um, was issued in uh, 2000 and expired in 2005, has been administratively extended since then. So it's a pretty, pretty old permit. Uh, but right now we're going through permit renewal uh, discussions with DEQ, um, doing the characterization monitoring, mixing zone studies and all the good work that is involved in uh, getting a new permit, which is anticipated to be next year. We'll see. Uh, so a little bit on our biosolids process, our existing process, as I mentioned, uh, two belt filter presses and our biosolids facility uh, was built around that class B program. Um, the cannibal process that I mentioned uh, actually failed to reduce the solids uh, adequately. And so since that plant was built, we've been unable to aerobically digest our solids. Um, and so we're dealing with uh, undigested solids that we're dewatering through our belt filter presses and then just disposing at the landfill. Uh, through the belt presses, we achieve about a 12 to 14% solids and our wasting and our solids process really has been manage, managing around odor control. Uh, as you can imagine, um, undigested solids don't smell very nice and we've got neighbors, very close neighbors nearby. So it's managing for odor and also managing around the landfill, uh, their hauling schedule and the, what they will receive from us. So you'll see, we've got lots of dumpsters in these pictures. Um, so it's not a good situation. So we wanted, um, we had some improvements. Uh, first of all, we really need to replace our de dewatering equipment. The belt presses were really, have been overworked and at the end of their life. Um, and we've, it's been many years trying to figure out what we're gonna do to um, treat our solids. And so we've just been hanging on to those uh, belt presses and, like uh, duct tape bailing wire situation. So those needed to be replaced. Um, and so finding an alternative treatment disposal system is what we really needed to do. And we had a long list of considerations um, that are listed there and uh, odor being one, as I mentioned, and also long-term uh, reliance on the landfill. Uh, and of course, cost is always big. And really we were had the desire um, to have a beneficial product and a desire for a class A material. And so we uh, went through a long, this, this many years of considering this is in, is in this one slide. Um, <laughs> Um, so we did a screening level review of all the options that are available to us, and we worked with Kennedy Jenks on that, uh, and, um, and we narrowed it down to basically four alternatives. And one is to keep doing what we're doing, just uh, keep sending our solids to the landfill. We evaluated that. The other thing we evaluated was our same solids process of not um, a digest digesting, but adding a class A treatment onto the end. And then we also looked at expanding our aeration digestion and then re and considered bringing back uh, anaerobic digestion. And so we evaluated the capital and operating costs in a variety of non-economic factors. Um, it we could do a whole talk on how we went through that selection process, but 
you know, numbers were crunched and decisions were made. And our preferred alternative uh, was to do, continue our existing process and then add on a class A composting treatment option. The other class A treatment that we considered was lime stabilization and a dryer, but we went with the composting. Um, so just a little bit background on, on what composting is. It's the decomposition, decomposition of organic material by microorganisms, which generates heat. And uh, you have to really manage the carbon to nitrogen uh, ratio. And so in our case, the, the main component of nitrogen are the WRF uh, dewatered solids. And then the carbon component is the woody material. So we add in wood chips, yard debris. Um, and in this business, it's either called amendment or bulking material. So you have good mixing and uh, you maintain a appropriate amount of air and moisture. There's a whole mix design around how you uh, properly compost. And, and if you do have a good process, what happens in the end is you have a stable organic product that's rich in nutrients. It's a marketable in-demand commodity. And uh, with class A compost, biosolids compost, it has unrestricted use. So you can even use it in your own vegetable garden. And to make a, a class A compost, uh, you have to follow um, the 40 CFR part 503 regulations. And that describes uh, what you need to do for a process to further reduce pathogens, PFRP, it's known as. And so you have to maintain a certain temperature in the compost pile as you're composting after you've mixed it up, a uh, temperature greater than 55 degrees C for three days. And you also have to, to prove your pathogen reduction um, before distribution. You have to test for either salmonella or fecal coliform, and you have to meet those requirements. Then there's also a vector attraction reduction. Uh, you have to maintain a temperature of 40 degrees C for 14 consecutive days and an average temperature of 45 degrees C. And there's also metals and uh, nutrients testing that needs to be performed. But really it's the, the time and temperature requirements that, that you, that's highly monitored to prove that you have a class A product. And all of this is uh, detailed in the city's uh, biosolids management plan. So to um, learn a bit more, we did a pilot, a year long pilot uh, with using our, our solids. We used the Gore covered system. It was a, a fabric cover made by Gore-Tex. If you didn't know, Gore, Gore has a whole composting line, uh, which I didn't know. Um, so uh, we used their system. We just tested various mixed recipes. Um, and then we had what, what we called odor panels. We brought people from the office who aren't normally around wastewater, who aren't de <laughs> desensitized <laughs> to the smell. And I gave them clipboards and they came out and smelled <laughs> <laughs> throughout the year. And we also had an open house with the neighbors and, and um, uh, city councilors um, to show them what kind of product that we could make. So a lot that I think we did five heaps over the year and we had many lessons learned. We made a great end product and we met the 503 requirements. And actually I brought a sample from the pilot up there if anyone wants to smell it. We also went on facility tours um, locally in Oregon and Washington. We visited uh, food waste composting facilities and also municipal biosolids composting facilities. Um, various kinds, windrow situations, with the, the one at the top right, that's a Gore facility up in Washington. Um, In-vessel facilities, uh, covered area and static pile facilities. We also visited Tacoma, which is not composting, but um, it's a, they have a class A soil blending uh, facility, which you probably all know. Um, so we got lessons learned. We talked with operators and owners. Um, got advice from them, looked at their equipment, looked at their end product, and just got some really good information for us as we went into design. Some of our design considerations, we decided to start small, uh, to start composting just 25% of our solids and keep sending about 75% to the landfill and in the hopes that we will uh, be successful and learn and grow, grow our markets, both the amendment market and the uh, end product. 
and, and hopefully expand in the future. One of the biggest considerations, of course, was odor control, uh, not only for um, the compost operation, but our, our biosolids facility, our, our dewatering facility. We focused on minimizing traffic in and out of the facility. Once it, it gets uh, uh, started up, there's a lot more probably truck traffic with deliveries. Um, we went with covering um, to control moisture in, mainly for aesthetics. We learned from a lot of the other facilities that they wished they had more covered storage. So we incorporated, incorporated that into our design. Uh, another element was phasing. We wanted phasing potential, but we have limited space on site. So that was something the design team needed to consider. And we also needed to update our biosolids management plan with DEQ approval. And we wanted to do that before we got into design, um, which we did. Uh, so this is just a few of our list of demands that we gave Charles. Um, <laughs> there were many more. Okay. The project team. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'll try to go through these relatively quickly. A big project, long, as Kristen had said, a, a, a multi-year, seems like a very long time since we started working together. So lots to talk about here. I'll try to get through these quickly, get us out to lunch. Um, so in terms of, wanted to talk a little bit about the project from an engineering perspective. Um, start off with talking about the design process. Um, Kristen's already talked a little bit about um, the selection of the compost technology. Um, touch on again real briefly on the initial capacity, as she mentioned, the importance of the phasing and the site layout, and then also some of the important ancillary equipment and facilities associated with the project. Okay, first off, com um, composting technology, specifically the selection process. Um, as Kristen had said, the city briefly considered windrow in vessel and quickly landed on um, covered aerated static piles. Um, as she mentioned, the city had done a, a year long um, pilot study with the Gore process. Um, the city ultimately landed on a more conventional um, covered aerated static pile um, design that utilizes 12 inches of essentially finished compost over top the compost pile to for insulation and maintain uh, pile um, temperatures. So specific to um, Albany, um, here's a little uh, figure, if you will. A couple of things I wanted to point out um, about the, the Albany design. Um, first of all, it's bunker design as opposed to a heap or a pile design for more space efficiency to again, try to um, keep things within the existing fence line. Um, the divider walls between the compost bays, the decision by the project team was to use ecology blocks that had it as a cost savings manage, uh, savings measure. Um, I'll get back to that if we've got time on some of the lessons learned. Um, so learn some things on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here was the, the temperature probes. The, the system is shown on the, on the figures having two online temperature probes and a third manual probe. It's actually all three of those probes are, are online and each probe has an upper and lower sensor. So the city is able to monitor, um, continuously monitor temperatures in the pile in six different locations. Um, the final thing I wanted to point out here is the aeration system. It's an in-ground aeration as opposed to pipe on grade. And the city elected to do that a little more cost, but it was is a maintenance um, savings uh, measure. It's easier to clean. Okay. Next thing, and talking about the in-ground aeration, um, this particular um, design by um, engineered compost systems um, it's a reversing aeration type system. Um, it's provided with two fans, um, a supply fan and an exhaust fan. Um, when in positive aeration mode, the supply fan pushes the air in um, underneath the, the pile and the exhausts up through and into the atmosphere. In reverse aeration, just does the opposite. The exhaust <laughs> fan comes on, draws air down through the top of the pile and eventually goes out through the associated biofilter, which was supplied again because the odor um, concerns. And I'll touch base on that um, just real uh, briefly here. Um, reversing aeration has a couple um, advantages. One is it helps maintain a better or more uniform uh, temperature profile along the vertical axis. So temperatures are, are more even from top to bottom than might otherwise 
be the case with a positive only aeration system. And then again, when in reverse aeration mode, you're pulling those potentially odorous air out and through the biofilter as opposed to just pushing it out into the atmosphere. Um, in terms of odor control, I've already talked a little bit about the biofilter that was um, specifically associated with the compost facility itself, just a simple um, bark wood chip material, three inches and larger. In theory, if you've got an up and, and running uh, compost system, when you have to periodically rebuild those piles, you seed it with a little compost. In our case, it just had to use um, raw bark chip. Um, also uh, associated with the project, the overall project, that is a um, odor or a um, carbon tower um, odor scrubbing system was installed um, and it pulls odorous air off the existing cake storage building. Okay, in terms of initial capacity, Kristen, or Kristen mentioned wanting to start off a relatively small, smaller project, but still have a significant um, project to work with. Cho choice was 25% of their current, at that time, current solids production in 2020. That equates to about 360 dry tons um, of solids a year and is estimated to produce um, 11,000 yards of compost on an annual basis. So in terms of phasing and site layout, as Kristen said, this is very important for the project, even though the city wanted to start out small, they didn't want to have throwaway project elements. So the, the effort or a lot of work back and forth with paper doll exercises and whatnot with, with city staff and the project team was to come up with a layout that could hit that 25% and then just be easily expanded over time. And more and equally important, remain within the existing fence line to be able to um, treat 100% of the plant's um, solids production inside the, the treatment facility. This is one of the original renderings, ended up being very close to what was ultimately designed and constructed. This is moving into 100% solids production, simply adding additional compost base to those that would have been constructed as part of the initial 25% adding more biofilter, um, secondary, and having to add some actual additional secondary composting bays, and then an additional uh, finished compost storage area. Finally, ancillary equipment, although not directly associated with the composting process itself, just equipment that's very critical to the overall success of the project. In includes, um, simple enough, front end loader. City decided to purchase a dedicated front end loader and equally important two five yard buckets that were dedicated to the process. One being, it's been termed the dirty bucket and the other one's being termed the clean bucket. The dirty bucket being used just to handle biosolids and the initial compost mix. And of course, this is done to prevent cross contamination. Next thing is mixing equipment. As Kristen mentioned, very important to um, mix the compost um, well prior to starting the process. Various mixer technologies out there, all from the agricultural industry, um, being you know real mixers, um, horizontal auger mixers, the latter, the horizontal auger mixer is better suited for composting. It's wet, it's denser material, it's sticky. So um, elected to go with the um, horizontal rotary auger. Uh, next is screening. Um, we looked at star screens and also um, more conventional trommel screens. The city elected to go with the trommel screen. It's a simpler screen, fewer moving parts, um, lower cost, and it's very commonly used in composting. Uh, side note on this, the city had originally thought that they would um, rent uh, screening equipment, store up finished biosolids for a period of two, three months, and then rent equipment and have a periodic screening event, okay? Um, once we got into the actual construction uh, project and, and well along the way, started looking for opportunities to rent, um, just the logistics, the cost scheduling, it became clear very quickly that, that um, purchasing their own equipment made a lot more sense. Um, buildings, Kristen mentioned again, you did a good job setting me up here. This is awesome. Um, decision was made to cover a couple of the buildings here in the Pacific Northwest. We have wet winters, okay? So it was deemed very important to cover the amendments um, to keep a more consistent moisture content throughout the year to make uh, the mix design from season to season a little bit easier. Um, 
It's also decided to cover the compost building itself, although not strictly needed from a process standpoint, provided additional weather protection and um, basically improved the visual appearance of the facility as a whole. Again, this is a first foray into class A composting for the city. All right, so where we are today, um, we're nearing the end of construction. After many years, we're, we're nearing the end of construction. Um, here's the site um, as it sat when construction so started in June, uh, 2021. Um, the rest of the plant is, is to the right or to the east and a little bit to the south. Um, you can see the existing dewatering building and existing cake storage building at the time. Like I said, construction's almost complete. Um, this is a photograph that was taken within the last couple of weeks, I think. So um, certainly everything's basically 100% done. Um, you can see the amendment um, compost storage building, the um, composting building itself uh, with associated biofilter, and then a little less visible here is the amazing compost here, too centrally located. Okay. As I said, um, construction's um, essentially done and the project's well into its startup and testing. Okay. Um, initially, a seven day operational test and 30 day acceptance tests were done to really prove out the equipment. Um, this is to, to prove out that the general contractor installed everything correctly and the equipment itself was operating um, as it was designed to. Um, that's behind us, past those, and now we're on to um, performance testing. And this is really proving out the design, okay? Making sure that the specified um, performance requirements, i.e. Can the system consistently meet class A biosol or composting requirements um, be met uh, consistently? And to do that, the formal um, performance test is going to consist of two sequentially produced batches that meet all class A requirements, namely PFRP and VAR. Um, we're not quite to the formal um, testing or performance testing yet. Um, the the um, system manufacturer ECS is provided an opportunity to work with city staff to um, produce at least four initial trial batches. It's kind of a shakedown cruise, if you will, working on, on different mixed designs and modifying um, aeration set points. Um, this is a screenshot actually from a temperature trace from trial batch number three that we're in the midst of right now. It's a couple days old actually. Um, from batch one to two to three, it's gradually improved. The mix designs changed, the aeration parameters have changed. Um, but on this, the third trial here, you can see after about day one, the temperatures um, all were above that, that magic 131 degree um, point. Um, by day three, four, we see a couple of the points here. These are in the upper section of the pile, start to drop down below that 131 degree. So we've not met, the pile's not met the uh, PFRP requirements. Um, so at this point, at about day five, the manufacturer recommended some changes to the aeration set points. Those were made by plant staff and the, the temperatures came back up above the required 131 degrees. So again, just the trial batches give everyone an opportunity to fine tune the process. Okay, so next lessons learned, and I want to say thus far, because we're early days in, right? Um, some of them were learned during both um, design and then on into construction. One was the, the um, decision by the project team to use ecology blocks for building um, divider walls. Um, it's a cost savings measure. Uh, it's a, you know, it was a good cost savings measure. When they start, the ecology blocks started showing up on site though, the, the quality control um, as these things are manufactured leave a little bit to be desired. Initially, the contractor had a heck of a time building both a, a plum wall and then also a good looking wall. Again, a public facing um, a project. So ultimately though, after a lot of hand picking of ecology blocks, they were able to, to build um, a number of very good looking um, divider walls. 
Next is amendment material. As I've said, the, we're in the, the initial trial batch phase of the project. Um, to date, we've had three different amendments um, and mixing them at, at various ratios, okay? So learning on what amendment material works best. Next is the mixer. Um, during design, it's, a, it's an initial project, um, good effective mixing located in a, um, a good location for operation staff to quickly get biosolids and move amendment and, and, and mix it um, efficiently. Um, didn't know exactly where to put this thing, okay? And so the decision was made to put it on a trailer, okay? So it could be moved around and the most uh, efficient spot could be identified, okay? So you can see it up on the wheels there. Um, however, once the initial uh, mixing event happened, it got very clear where a good mixing spot was gonna be. And um, we also heard that it's portable, but it's not really portable. It takes quite a bit of effort to put it in, in, in place, get it all hooked up, get it ready to go. So it's not like you can just back up to it with the trailer and move it off site. How are you doing, Andrew? So, okay, perfect. Um, next one, need for water. Unfortunately, during the design, this was something that, that a part of the uh, design team didn't anticipate. Um, so far um, for the first three trial batches, each batch has had to um, have 1,800 to 1,900 gallons of water added to it. And that's my understanding. It's been with one of the operators with the utility hose um, spraying down the mix as, as it's being processed, okay? City currently has plans to install a, a spray bar system with a remote operated solenoid valve um, so that the, the operator and the, the loader can turn on and off the water automatically. Next is sweeping equipment, just real briefly on this. City knew that, that housekeeping was gonna be a concern with composting, but decided early on in the project to hold off until um, the um, process actually got up and running. Um, soon after the first amendment uh, got delivered and the first mixing started happening, it became clear very quickly um, that um, sweeping equipment's critical to good housekeeping. So, and then the last thing I'll, I'll leave you with, turn it back over to Kristen, is the temperature probes. As I mentioned, the temperature probes, it's about six feet long. They've got a, a temperature sensor at the bottom and a, you know, another towards the top. Um, what the city's found, um, especially after the pile has been co initially constructed, the pile will, will gradually, especially after the first couple of days, will tend to settle. Well, that upper temperature sensor gets closer and closer to the surface and you start reading the atmospheric temperature, not what's actually going on in the pile that puts you in danger of falling out of PFRP, okay? And so what plant staff have had to do periodically is go out and actually push the, the probe down deeper into the pile as the pile settles. Um, unfortunately, at times, this creates a, um, kind of a chimney effect um, alongside the the probe where when in reversing aeration mode, the atmospheric air just gets swept down along the temp temperature probe, again, cooling that um, upper sensor artificially. And what the plant staff have found is if they just pick the probe up, move over a few inches and reinsert it, it jumps right back up. And this is what happened here. Okay. So again, the purple line. The purple line. At the beginning. Oh, over here. Yeah. All right, um, hand it back over to you. All right, this is our last slide. Uh, so next steps for the city, um, basically we're just getting through the startup and we want to perfect our process and make good, safe uh, compost. And uh, initially our plan is to uh, be the first end users of it, use it internally at city facilities and parks. And we're, working on reliable sources of that bulking material and working on um, building partners um, with um, other agencies that may have a bulking material that they see as waste, but they want some of our compost and have sort of a, 
uh, partners that way and also building partners for our, our end, end uh, use. And eventually we will uh, engage the public. Um, and here's some pictures of others, how others have engaged the public. The bottom left is La Connor, Washington. That's their free pile. And they've, they've put some bollards there in front because there's some landscape contractors who would come with their uh, bobcat and start loading their truck. But this is really for, um, you know, the average homeowner to come with their shovel and get, a, you know, some free compost from the city. Uh, they also have a yard debris uh, this drop off the, the top left, that's also La Connor. And uh, Centralia has a, at the top right there has a demonstration garden. So we using their compost. So we intend to do that as well. And um, then eventually uh, we'll build acceptance and start selling our compost. Uh, the bottom right picture is Newburg, uh, Oregon. Uh, you can't see it, but they sell their compost for $14 a yard. Um, and so they, the operator there loads people's trucks. It's all electronic payment. Um, and they, I think they have septic, septage um, disposal there too. So they're, they're used to dealing with the public in that way. Um, so that's our, our goal. And then actually the overall goal is to um, build that demand and then eventually expand our composting facility to 100% uh, of our solids and stop, stop sending it to the landfill. And that is all we have. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but. And if you want to come look at our compost, <laughs> it's beautiful. Actually, that one's really old. I saw the date is from 2014. That was our first pilot heap. Yeah. Yeah. Are you still using the dog crackers? And if not, what are you using? What percentage of cake are you mixing? I see you guys say you're adding water. Right, I know it sounds counterintuitive. Um, so yeah, we didn't touch on that at the project was also to uh, change our dewatering equipment. And so during this whole project, we were on temporary dewatering as we took out our old belt filter presses and we went with FKC screw presses. And those are, are those completely on board, They've gone through all the testing and everything. So we have beautiful new screw presses. Um, there was a question back here. Um, you said that you have a pretty large number of significant industrial users for a small city. Have you had any problems with um, metals or exotic materials accumulating in your biosolids? Or uh, no, uh, we haven't. We have a really good pretreatment program, um, and the the actual amount of, of flow is from the industries is quite small. It's like one percent, maybe. Um, so we haven't seen that, no. Yes. Yeah, my question was a little bit similar to this first one, but it's about moisture. Because I heard, um, I'm not even sure if this is correct, but the city of Portland has tried composting in the past, and maybe Newburgh is composting. Uh, and uh, I hear a lot of stories about people having very high moisture content and just you know, carbon here, and the really debris that they're mixing with the biosolids. And, and there's a mix moisture content of the two materials coming together is really high and they kind of need to start drying and when they start drying they see negative moisture content so it's one of those common themes that you discuss with people in the community so how are you guys planning for moisture well we for the input materials we test them we under we know what the moisture content is going in from our solids and also the amendment so there's a, a certain mix design that we 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 need and so we test ahead of time so we know exactly what that moisture is in Newburgh, they have a totally different they have an in vessel system they use um, dried uh, um, sawdust so it's quite different so they really have to have a very dry material going into their compost operation any other? Yeah, I mean, the, the moisture can change seasonally, right? And it's also yeah. highly um, dependent on the source of amendment, right? So if you've got a yard debris program and you're kind of at the whim of whatever the public brings in, that's going to be more quality material. I can see the moisture content changing in that time of year. I think the current plan with the city is to be to control that a little bit more, at least initially, mm -hmm. more tree, you know, city crews and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Right, trees. and fresh material is key. You can't have old, like, you know, wood material that's been already cut up for years. You really need kind of fresh carbon. 
Yeah. I, I apologize if this is a composting one on one question. Uh, you, you guys talked about uh, aeration scenarios. Is does the aeration throttle temperature, or is that basically it? if you let it go at one hundred percent, it just gets too hot, too cold? Yeah, that and Charles, you might know better than me. Setup. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the so the two temperature probes uh, throughout the pile. If one probe uh, is is too hot, is showing too hot, it will pull air. To cool it down, so the the temperatures really for for monitoring whether you're meeting your the PFRP and VAR, but also to make sure you don't get too hot. And and, and I'm assuming too hot kills the uh, the biota. The too hot, you're worried about fire. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. We do. Yes, uh, we changed to a liquid. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not sure we've considered that. Um, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time.